the average person in the general public, when they think about uh, scientists, right, uh, studying COVID-19, they often just think about uh, the CDC or the World Health Organization. Um, so essentially, they have uh, the authoritative voice on a lot of these topics. Um, so what do you think the implications of that are? Well, it means that those bodies have a difficult job. They have a big responsibility and carry perhaps an undue weight in the sense that one should always be open to other voices. So not only is it the responsibility of CDC and, and World Health Organization to pay attention to other voices, but even the public should also be constantly looking at other source information and reassessing it. Uh, that's really how science works, through an open exchange of ideas. Uh, and sometimes uh, new ideas are not popular or not even widely understood, and then they turn out ultimately to be accepted and to change people's thinking. Because even scientists don't agree all the time, Yes, right? there's no such thing as an authoritarian voice in science, and if there were, that would essentially be the end of science, because science is based on a free exchange of ideas and an openness to being wrong. One must always be skeptical of any hypothesis or theory of a phenomenon because a better theory or a more plausible hypothesis may still come along and new evidence may come along. So in the case of uh, COVID-19 transmission, um, unfortunately, uh, I have faced this challenge of talking to my colleagues here at MIT or even uh, business leaders and others who have reached out to me uh, about my work uh, to get advice and that they may even agree and understand uh, what I'm saying. And they may agree with the principles that I'm, that I'm teaching and the evidence that I provide, but they say, but to be prudent and also to protect against lawsuits and other, you know, other factors and also to be protected from criticism, essentially, it's just easier to fall back on what the authorities are saying. Because essentially what they put on their website defines uh, what might be, say, medical misinformation when it comes to COVID-19. Yes, now that to me is, uh, is, is very unfortunate. I know it's well-meaning, and as I said, we have to acknowledge there, there is medical misinformation that is sometimes intentionally uh, put out. But I think in most cases, most scientists, I know myself, um, are just simply trying to use our perspectives and tools that we know and phenomena that we understand, models we understand, to make predictions and to contribute to the conversation. It's listed specifically on YouTube site, which is, I hope, going to be streaming my videos, that questioning the s official local guidelines uh, for fighting the pandemic, including social distancing measures, is considered medical misinformation. I don't think this course is medical misinformation. I'm simply providing you information about the physics of transmission. What you choose to do with that and what a policymaker chooses to do with that is involves many factors. But it's not appropriate to limit access uh, to this knowledge. Uh, and it's important also to question assumptions. There's nothing sacred about the six-foot rule. In some cases, it's inadequate. And in other cases, it's overly conservative. It's important to be open to those other ideas and to, in fact, protect your spaces or protect your loved ones by using ideas that you can hear from somebody like me or from taking this course and not only from those very small number of authoritative voices in the world who, partly because of the responsibility they have and the pressures they feel, have to be very conservative and very slow in making any change to their official guidance. So I guess the downside of controlling uh, what kind of information can be put online is um, if you have a different scientific opinion, it's just more difficult to even voice it, right? Yes, exactly. It's, it's, it becomes difficult for the normal scientific debate to even occur if some scientific debate is, is something is labeled as misinformation. There are many examples in the history of science where an extremely well-accepted theory, even one that was accepted for centuries, was eventually overturned or replaced with a modified theory and a different hypothesis. For example, at the time when infectious air was first being uh, debated and discussed uh, in the early 1900s, it was not even clear at that time to scientists that matter is made out of atoms. People believed in matter was a continuum. The evidence for the atomic nature of matter was just beginning at that very time when people were thinking about, is the air infectious or not? And Obviously, major revolution in science happened at that time in terms of understanding quantum mechanics and the molecular structure of matter. Um, it doesn't mean the people before that were wrong. They just didn't have full knowledge. So the authorities at that time were not right. We can go back further in time. At one point, the authorities uh, believed that the Earth is flat or that the sun orbits around the Earth. And it was brave scientists who looked at the evidence 
and decided that the evidence pushed them to a different hypothesis that had to speak against the authorities and needed to be heard in order for change to happen. I don't think the situation is any different today. We don't want to live in a world where science is settled and where certain ideas are called misinformation and others are not, because then how is it possible to have any new discoveries or any scientific debate? Debate always begins with somebody who has a different hypothesis or a different idea. That's how science has to progress. That's how science has to progress. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, you know, there can't be bad actors intentionally fueling misinformation, and obviously that is happening, but the best way to fight misinformation is with more information. You say, okay, well, this person is making this argument. Let it be heard. What is the evidence for that argument? What is the evidence for this argument? That's how science works, and eventually we reach a consensus. If we silence certain voices, it has a chilling effect on everybody because you silence one person who may actually be a bad actor who's intentionally fueling misinformation, but it has the effect on somebody else who's not a bad actor and actually has an insight. Maybe they noticed a certain spreading event couldn't possibly have happened through contact, physical contact, but actually might have happened through the air, but they feel uncomfortable saying that because it appears to contradict official authorities. Do you think that'll leave a certain burden on the public uh, when they have to look at so much information and make a choice for themselves in terms of what's right and what's wrong? Yes, I mean, this is the age that we live in. We have mass amounts of information, and, and I, it is unfortunate that uh, all of us really inhabit our own worlds of media and information, uh, which are not the same as everyone else. And so it is difficult for uh, sort of open debates to happen, uh, which are sort of free of bias and are looking at only the sort of more objective facts. Um, but at the very least, we have to hope that scientists uh, have the motivation to try to have open and honest debates. So what should be the role of the CDC and the WHO? Well, I think for one thing, they have the responsibility to provide the justification for their own guidance. So I do feel that too much of the public health guidance is, is essentially by fiat, is that it is this number and this rule because it is. But the problem is what if the authorities are not 100% right? And what if they're later gonna change their mind? There's nothing wrong with that. They should be able to do that. In fact, they should be constantly paying attention to the latest evidence and reassessing. Um, but that means that we shouldn't really be always just taking the authority's voice as 100% true. I would like to see what is the argument? Why is it six feet and not five feet? I would like to see the scientific evidence that says it should be six feet, that's the right number. Because actually the, the World Health Organization says three feet. Why three feet? Why not two feet? Why not four feet? You see, so what's the analysis that at least leads those agencies to make circles of recommendations? It shouldn't be just, uh, you know, like God has given the Ten Commandments and this is how it is. But it, once you acknowledge that and you give the argument for the, the recommendation, then it's easier to provide other evidence that can be brought up in competition. If the guideline is presented simply as this is how it is, because we know, um, then there's really no way to fight that. There's no way to even question it. And that, I think, impedes the progress of science and also the uh, ability to fight a, a new pandemic when it comes along. This is the big reason that I've created this massive online course, because I'd like to simply make my case. So I have a paper on COVID-19 transmission and I'm working on others. So I'm doing some, I'm doing some scientific analysis in this area. And I know that doesn't reach a very broad audience of general public and other people that are scientifically minded, and it may not reach people in the agencies that make the official guidelines. But what I'd like to accomplish here is to teach at least my way of thinking and my own scientific analysis and what is the data that I've used and what are the methods and what are the assumptions so that my recommendations can be uh, judged objectively and compared to other recommendations that are made. So I would just advocate for uh, Again, an open exchange of ideas where evidence is presented.